Okay, welcome back everyone. I'm John Furrier with Silicon Angle. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract a signal from the noise. I'm joined by co-host Jeff Frick with theCUBE. And our next guest is uh, Nisha Talagala with Fusion IO, lead architect uh, here at, uh, at the show at Pocono Live. Welcome to theCUBE. So we, know, we always talk about the software-defined data center, and that has been the rage since, I think, VMworld two years ago, started to see software-defined networking, virtualization. That kind of gets everyone's attention to, to the changes in the data center. Um, and that's great and all. We'd love to see this software modern era kind of evolve. But one of the things that we've been following with Fusion IO is just how well Flash has played in, in the optimization of data center performance, speeds and feeds, IOPS if you will, but now that's all evolving, right? And you yes. guys announced yesterday the non-volatile memory compression, yes. uh, Oracle supporting a big endorsement that came in late in the wire last night, we saw that. Yes. Um, you gave a talk here on the, the data center, all flash data centers, so, so that's a big battleground for at many levels, not just companies trying to get market share, but for customers mm -hmm. looking at how to evolve and be positioned for the future in the data center. So share with us some of the things that you see and highlight some of the things you talked about this morning. Sure, so I think you know, the, you know, the, the transformation of the data center through Flash in the last few years has already been very, very substantial, but it's still at the very beginning of, of this particular journey. And so what I covered in my talk today was you know, kind of the overall path of evolution of you know, Flash in the data center seen from the point of view of the MySQL database as a specific application and you know there's been you know a number of different you know very substantial things that have happened in the last few years mostly about you know adapting to the you know the speed and the sheer you know speed of iops and latency that flash brings and a lot of great changes and you know optimizations have come up in the mysql releases of the last few years to really exploit that. You know, what we uh, announced yesterday, which you know, we were very excited to be able to announce with you know, basically all of our partners, you know, MariaDB, Oracle, and Procona, was what we consider to be the next wave of optimization and enhancements for databases with Flash, and that is what we call Flash awareness where you're recognizing the fact that you're not dealing with a really fast disk necessarily, you're dealing with a brand new medium, medium that is now pretty much a staple in, this, you know, in the data center, and which is why we use the term all flash data center. And then now how can we you know, adapt and improve applications to be able to take, you know, make use of that? So that's what we mostly announced yesterday. We announced a, a feature called NVM compression that comes on the heels of a previous uh, you know, feature we had announced called Atomic Writes. And, uh, and we're very excited about it. You know, we always talk about you know, the history of the, of the computer re revolution and mm -hmm. you know, disk used to make up for all the inadequacies of RAM and you know, page swapping out, all kinds of memory management, you know, right. you know, device management stuff. Uh -huh. Now it's the other way around. Disk is now the issue. And when you look at the, some of the non-volatile memory performance, like looking, looking more like DRAM, Absolutely. how is that changing the game for developers, especially as they look for the scale, not just scale in terms of performance, but now you have multi-platform environments, you're dealing with a lot of different kinds of stacks. Yes. Um, talk about that dynamic. So I think you know there's a lot of different things. So one of them is that in in the disk era world, you know, developers spent a great deal of time trying to figure out how to you know um, overcome some of the issues or limitations of disk drives. And so you know things like how you lay out your data and things and how being very aware of the fact that there's a disk arm and things like that. There was a tremendous amount of technology and software that was developed just to optimize for that. Flash renders most of that you know largely unnecessary because Flash is so performant that a lot of the difficulties that you have to go through, you don't have to go through those anymore. It opens up a new set of you know, opportunities. You, know, you can certainly consider them challenges or opportunities, but you know, opportunities in the form of there's so much more parallelism now, how do you make use of it? You know, can you write software in a way that's simpler, more scalable, that takes you know, the best use of the underlying Flash? And this is again, you know, while this is transformative in itself, it's also the beginning of a larger trend because flash is much faster than disk, it's much closer to memory. The ability to see it in a more memory context is far greater. The technologies that are coming down the pipe are, are even lower latency. So therefore, there is this, you know, what we call convergence of memory and storage, where the line between you know, DRAM and disk was always such a hard line, right, right. but the line between DRAM and flash is very blurry. 
So I wonder if you can give a couple of examples of, of uh, developers using the new capabilities in the, in the All Flash Data Center to improve existing applications. But then I think what's more exciting, and I think what, what Gary Orson talks a lot about, is, is this, this infrastructure enabling really a new way to, to think about the problem. And if you can give some examples contrasting to that type of, of kind of net new opportunity that's, that's kind of flashed from the bottom up in terms of the, the application. Absolutely. So I think, you know, you know, so one of the things I covered in my talk this morning was sort of the three phases of flash evolution. So, you know, enabling these technologies to, you know, benefit existing apps is what we've called flash as disk, which is it is a really, really fast disk. And so you can get a lot of benefit just by seeing it that way without having to become flash aware or anything like that. And so you see applications, you know, running, you know, many you know, degrees faster, being able to deliver more transactions per dollar per watt, which is the most important thing. So it's not just that it's faster, it's actually more efficient per unit of work done. So all of that has been going on for the last five years with tremendous success, and that has propelled the you know, more broad, uh, you know, widespread adoption of Flash. And what, we're, what we're announcing is sort of the second wave, which is Flash awareness. And that can be applications adapting, it could be you know, file systems, for example, adapting, and thereby any application, even a legacy application that runs on top of a, an optimized file system will benefit. So one of the reasons why we've developed our own file systems, it's called NVMFS, is to enable that kind of you know, benefit for unmodified apps. And then the transition into much more of a memory-oriented world is a third step. When, when is that happening? I think it's you know it's imminent probably somewhere in the next few years we will start to see that. I mean one of the things that you know we uh, you know uh, introduced last year as part of our, some of our open sourcing was um, enhancements to the Linux kernel to improve virtual memory. So the first phase of that is already happening. Some of those changes have already made it into the upstream kernels, and what that does is it changes the virtual memory system so that. Applications can still think they have a lot of memory, but what they really have is a tier of DRAM and flash. And so they can benefit very transparently. So it's already happening, and it will ramp. Nisha, talk about some of the applications that are coming around the corner from this. And obviously, this creates a different dynamic from a programming standpoint. You know, we were talking on the opening segment about MySQL's challenges around out-of-the-box replication and high availability areas that you guys are very comfortable with and have done some work in. How does MySQL go to the next level? And, and as things roll out in the data center with, with the memory architectures changing and evolving, what are some of those new applications? So how does MySQL scale up out of the box in the future with replication and high availability? And what are some of the new applications that will we see come around the corner? Sure, so I mean, I think you know, so one of the, the panel this morning actually you know, spent a lot of time talking about the future of MySQL uh, at scale, and you know, there are, there's a lot of people who are already deploying MySQL at, at very large scale. So I think there's a lot of learning, a lot of practical deployments in you know, companies like Facebook, Twitter, the folks who created the web scale, you know, Alliance, and so forth. So all of that is happening fairly naturally already. Uh, as far as trends that are coming down the wire, you know, um, you know, one of the biggest trends that we see is this this, you know, memory and storage convergence trend with some of the in-memory databases, you know, and so what people are finding is that the classic world of, you know, my analytics is over here, my transactions are over here, and they don't meet and things like that, was in some sense created out of necessity because you couldn't put the two together. It, it just didn't work. But now when you have these faster technologies, suddenly I can have my transactions, I can have my analytics be up to the moment and things like that, and people are responding very much to the value of that. So that's probably one of the biggest trends. We were talking about last night's event we had up in San Francisco, AT&T Park, with all the sports teams, big data and sports kind of intersecting. So it was more of a fun event, really, with the executives. They weren't, we weren't getting in the weeds like here. But they're talking, it's about vision, leadership, and big data has focused the attention on using data first. Yes. Really designing around data as a competitive advantage. And why we're so excited about the web scale SQL announcement is it really points to companies like LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Google, who use data as a competitive advantage as part of the app, the core part of the application, part of the development process. So with, with that, what are some of the things that you're seeing architecturally that companies are, are doing or trying to do to be data first? Um, and, and how does that con compare and contrast just even a few years ago? So I think it's, you know, being data first, absolutely completely agree. It's, you know, it is a very, very big trend. And some of it that is, you know, how do I make sure that, you know, you know, 
ways that I process my data have the most up-to-date data. So if data is coming in from one source and being analyzed in another source, how do I put them together as quickly as possible? How do I best use you know, some of the you know, upcoming innovations in processors you know, to generate you know, as much processing of the data as possible and things like that? And so you know, we're seeing that in the database community. We're seeing it in the NoSQL community around some of the analytics. You know, we see it with you know products like you know SAP's HANA and things like that. And so it is everywhere. You know, and, and most of it is about you know low latency, efficiency, and how to make the best use of your resources. And then what's the next big challenge that you're looking to overcome, or that I should say this community is looking to overcome? So that's I think an interesting question. I mean, I'm. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure if there's necessarily one challenge, but I think the quest for efficiency and scale is pretty much never ending, right? Because, you know, particularly when you're deploying things at massive scales, even small inefficiencies, you know, in a single node translate into millions of dollars right. of, you know, operating expenses. So I think there's an ongoing shift to how do I squeeze expenses out? Because most people, the, you know, the money that they make is between the price of the service they offer right. and what it costs to run that service. So the, you know, the quest to increase efficiency is just ongoing. It's always been a challenge, but I think it's still a challenge. So still the really kind of incremental yeah. takedowns, little Basically, by little, little by little. little. By little. Okay. Jeff, I got to ask you a question, Jeff, because you know, you're, you're more looking at the, the business landscape. What, what's your take on, on what people are thinking about in the data center? Just even last night, some of the other customers we've talked to, I mean, what, what's your take on, on the business side? What's the mindset? I think as we as we move closer and closer to kind of a rent versus own world, it, it just seems to make more and more sense to outsource uh, the data center operation to people that specialize in data center operation. Just like you know the, the great uh, service that we all use forever, ADP. It, 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 nobody ever talked about ADP. It's like the great first outsourced you know internal operation that nobody does anymore. So again, why would anyone want to run a data center unless it's their core competency? It's complicated. Uh, with rising energy costs, changing infrastructure uh, and architecture, it's hard to keep up. So why wouldn't you put as much of that out to a specialty provider um, out there as opposed to doing it yourself? Really uh, concentrate on your core competency. I think we just continue to see an evolution of people focusing their internal resources on the things that give them competitive advantage versus infrastructure that they can put out to somebody else. And again, I, I just love ADP because nobody talks about it. They've been doing this on the payroll side forever, and everyone knows what exactly that means. Nisha, I want to ask you about uh, the show for the folks out there watching or watching on demand. Why is Percona Live an important show? I mean, it doesn't get the fanfare that Microsoft Build gets right now, so it's the Windows phone, everyone's talking about it, you know, compared to the iPhone. Um, but why is this show important right now? So, I mean, I think this is this show is you know is is one of the biggest opportunities for the MySQL community to kind of get together and you know talk about the, the community itself, the features, the software, and things like that. And MySQL is a is a very very important you know application. All of the distros, MariaDB, Percona, Oracle, MySQL, very important application. We have a lot of customers who run it. You know, in the messaging space, in some of the gaming space, even in the enterprise spaces. And so I think it's a great show. It's there's you know lots and lots of vibrancy in it. What's been the biggest surprise? Of the show, either upside or downside. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I've seen a downside. You know, I've been very happy with the show so far, and, and how much, in some ways, the show talks not just about the technology itself, but also about the process. You know, how is the community doing? Is it, you know, encouraging everybody and things like that? I thought that was great. And how is the community doing? Because it's it's one of the older open source communities around. We go, we go to a lot of open source shows, open networking summit we were at uh, the other day. There, you know, there's a lot of kind of newer uh, open source project, open stack Absolutely. summit we'll go to uh, in Atlanta here shortly. But this one's been around for a long time. It so there's probably unique challenges that come just with being a little uh, longer in the tooth than some of the newer um, the newer open source projects. Yeah, I mean, from what I've seen, I mean, you know, not just sort of in attending the event itself, but just the you know experience that we've had working with the partners, it's been very positive. You know, I think the, the pace of change is really great. The pace of innovation is really great. People adopt things very quickly, so I think it's you know it's been, it's very healthy. Oh, good. Very vibrant. Yeah. So I want to ask you a final question. Give us an um, inside look at what's happening at Fusion IO from a product standpoint, from an execution standpoint. So you guys have done a great job um, as you guys go into the data center. Do you see the software-defined data center really emerging? And what are some of the things that you guys are doing right now as a company and product? 
Sure. Um, so I think you know Fusion.io's product portfolio has expanded very substantially in the last few years. So the company you know was initially kind of very successful with the PCIe Flash devices. That is really where we established the market. That seem you know is still a very very significant part of our business. But you know some of the new things that we've introduced in the last uh, couple of years, particularly our caching products, you know things that we've done in the VDI space with the introduction of IOVDI, you know uh, at the last uh, VM show as well as our appliance products we have you know two different storage appliances now beyond the IOVDI the IO control which is a low-end uh, you know um, hybrid kind of storage for more of the SMB market as well as the ion data accelerator which is for the higher end all flash market so you know we continue to sort of expand our product portfolio and focus on application acceleration at all levels so we're here live at Percona Live. We'll be covering the rest of the day here on SiliconANGLE.TV. I'm John Furrier with Jeff Frick. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break.